Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I love deconversion stories. I mean, I am one. I tell one constantly. I escaped. I'm out, right? And I love to hear the stories of other people who are out. They they got out. They escaped. They managed to bust through the cocoon and experience the outside world. And then they tell their stories to other people. That's what the broadcast today is going to be about. I'm talking here about a book called Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church. Uh, the website for the book is emptythepews.com. It's a compilation of 21 compelling essays by people who survived hardline, hardcore, authoritarian, religious ideology. And they escaped. They managed to bust out from this sort of alternate universe that their religions put them in to discover the real world beyond. Uh, The website for the book is emptythepews.com. Two special guests joining me to talk about it. The editors of this book, Chrissy Stroop, she's from central Indiana. She has a B.A. in history and German from Ball State University. She's got a doctorate in modern Russian history from Stanford. She spent some time living in Moscow, and she actually taught at a Russian university. She has her own escape story that she features in the book. And then Lauren O'Neill, she's a senior editor at Midnight Breakfast, She's a contributing editor at Catapult, and she's the co-host of a podcast called Sunday School Dropouts. She was born in San Francisco. She now lives in New York, and she is also co-editor of Empty the Pews. Thank you both, Chrissy and Lauren, for joining me on the show. Thanks so much for having us, Seth. It's great to be on your show. We're very excited. Saw the write-up in the Washington Post about your book. The write-up was released on the 16th of January, and it talks about the book Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church. I find this interesting because if you listen to the evangelicals, they're talking about how it's a time of revival. I mean, sure, they're selling a persecution narrative, and they're terrified of those secular (laughs) people. But they're also trying to sell this notion that people are rushing back to the church in droves and you beg to differ. So, Lauren (laughs) or Chris, you tell me, what is your research revealed? Well, there's a difference between the power that the evangelical church currently holds politically and their actual numbers. They're definitely in in a demographic decline. I almost said democratic decline, but they never were democratic people to be in the first place. Um, Burn. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, they're about 16% of the U.S. population now. That's down sharply uh, from, you know, just uh, several years back when they were about a quarter of the U.S. population still. Unfortunately, though, through the 2018 midterms, they still made up 25% of the electorate. So they vote disproportionately. Uh, which does give them a lot of power in our government. And of course, the Electoral College and voter suppression helps them with that as well. But they're clearly afraid of using the youth. In fact, that's where the hashtag empty the pews came from. Me riffing on Twitter after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017 and being so frustrated with evangelical leaders either saying nothing or, you know, going to bat for Trump and saying, oh, he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. How do you get through to people like that? I mean, you don't. They're, they're unreachable. But what would put them on notice, you know, telling them that indeed they are losing the youth. And so Empty the Pews became a call for stories. And that was after Lauren and I had started working on this book. And we both very much believe in the power of stories. And you know, it's, so it's kind of ironic because like the, the call story is very common in Christianity, especially evangelicalism. 
the story of how you were saved or the story of how you came to the church. Um, and the reason that it's so popular is because stories are powerful. And we've kind of reversed that here. Yeah, I mean, they try to control the story too, right? So we're taking them back because they very much have a narrative about apostates, right? Uh, they're backsliders. They were never saved to begin with. They just want to have sex as much as possible. Um, you know, so which are we all think fine. That- <laughs> but it's the no true Scotsman thing, or like anybody who left Christ was never a follower of Christ. To be no one who knows the risen Lord could ever walk away. That right, kind of thing, right, right, right. Ex- exactly. This kind of extreme gaslighting narrative that um, has wielded a lot of power, and it's um, you know been part of how the voices of people who have left this kind of religion get erased from the discourse. And so, I'd really like to see people who have left what sociologists call high demand religious groups really get more of a seat at the table in the public sphere. It's interesting to look at the books that are marketed in this way about the the search for and the attempt to reach the millennials and the Gen Xers, books titled Lost and Found, and Reaching Millennials and Effectively Reaching Young Adults. And you know, you can see that the church is conscious of the fact that they are bleeding the thirty somethings and younger. Was this apparent in your research as well? A sort of a panicked religious establishment going, hey, wait a minute, if we don't have the young people, we have no future, right? Oh, definitely. That's where pretty much where the hashtag empty the pews came from um, in my head when I just kind of spontaneously came up with it was this idea that let's throw what they're afraid of in their faces. Because, you know, I grew up in evangelical subculture and I've seen all those kinds of ridiculous. Oh, here's how we get young people back in church. So we have cooler PowerPoint slides or, you know, we uh, get the latest rock. Christian worship music and, you know, it's all nonsense. They don't actually listen to the people that need reaching according to them. <laughs> in fact, I will say I was on, I was the lead singer in my church's youth group worship band, which was all Christian rock. And like everyone in the worship band is now an atheist. So <laughs> that kind of had the opposite effect. Yeah, Christian music will sort of have that impact. Of, <laughs> you know, I was, that's part of the culture I came from. Just a quick digression. You can then speak to the fact that... Christian culture is watching popular culture and then borrowing all the stuff that they think will resonate with young people, right? I mean, whether it's the clothes they wear or the artists they like or the music they buy or any of that type of stuff, you know, they're, they're the copycats, right? Yeah. The, the problem is the reason that those things are powerful, like the reason that rock music or like hip hop is powerful is like usually because of things that have nothing to do with religion. Not that pop culture, like not that music can't grapple with religion. And sometimes it does in in an honest and compelling way. But usually it's like about heartbreak or it's about sex. And you can't just like, I mean, as much as Christian contemporary music has tried to just make like love songs be about God instead of a romantic (laughs) interest, it doesn't, it's never going to really work. This is it why, loses all its power. Well, South Park is often just really stupid, but once in a while it really hits the nail on the head with some brilliant satire. And that whole episode, Christian Rock Hard, where Cartman starts a Christian rock band, is pretty brilliant. Yeah. Empty the <laughs> pews. Uh, let's talk. Chrissy Stroop, Lauren O'Neill, let's talk about the letters, the stories, the encounters that you have experienced. The reasons they're leaving. Just a few examples. What have you seen? Patriarchy, rejection for being queer, uh, which is also a part of my story, though I didn't even realize I was queer until much later because of repression. Uh, My story in the book is about missionary shenanigans, let's say, and how that definitely contributed to my loss of faith. I mean, we also have a whole section of the book titled Intellectual Odysseys, um, which is just kind of like when you examine hard right Christianity from an intellectual perspective, you can't get very far down before you start hitting some problems. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Mike McHarg. He does this, this podcast, um, Science Mike. And he, he's a Christian. He went through a big crisis of faith. He was raised very conservative and you know, was not supposed to believe in evolution or anything. And he, when he went through his crisis of faith and, and temporarily considered himself an atheist, he was like, I, all of a sudden, I got... 5,000 times smarter (laughs) because I didn't have to, I didn't have to like suppress the knowledge that evolution is real. I didn't have to like 
spend all this mental energy just shoving that down. And so all of a sudden it was like, boom, I understand everything and it all makes sense. We're seeing the inability then in many ways for the church to replicate, right? It survives by creating converts and the parents download it to their kids and they have youth ministry. I'm sure given your background, you're familiar with the types of tactics they have going after kids. Mm -hmm. They've got programs that are fun and fanciful and they've got playgrounds and characters, cartoons and music and all this stuff. They've got and free childcare in the summer. Free child care in the summer? Oh, yes. The child care. The uh, <laughs> vacation Bible school. Vacation Bible school, yeah. VBS. The source of much trauma. <laughs> Send them off for a couple of weeks to learn about Jesus, and they come back supposedly better Christian children, I guess. And, and most but just a lot like of times, terrified of hell. <laughs> well, that happens too, yeah. And a lot of times more moderate parents, they might be Christian, but you know they don't think they're sending their kids in for this hardcore conversion hellfire stuff. But they are. And yeah, um, dude, evangelicals have no qualms about doing that to other people's children without permission. They just sneakily try to get them in the door. You know, they call it outreach. And a lot of people can't say no to free child care, right? I mean, it's not like we have much, you know, of a social support network through the welfare, through the United States government or anything. I remember when I went to VBS as a child my best friend who lived across the street from me came with me who like her family was not Christian at all. (laughs) And like in retrospect, I'm like, what did her parents think when she like, I wonder what she said when she came home. Oh my God. I hope she's not a fundamentalist now. No, she's cool now. (laughs) Speaking to your point, Chrissy, I remember we, when I was doing church work years ago, there was a local church here in town that would send buses out to these low income neighborhoods And the parents probably eager to get their kids out or to give them an experience or to give them a free meal because there was a free meal as long as you went to the church. The buses would just go around to these low income neighborhoods and scoop up the kids, not the parents, just the kids. And they would go in and have their church service after you went through the service. Only then did you get the meal, I believe. And then they would let them play for a while and drop them back off. This was attractive to a lot of people. It was also fertile ground. For the agents of indoctrination, right? They use all kinds of tactics. They also try to sneak into public schools and, you know, send invitations home to parents with kids to uh, join the Bible club or whatever. And it's much less benign than many parents might think. But hey, free pizza. Empty the pews. Stories of leaving the church. Researching and receiving the info. Any surprises, any things that hit you and you're like, holy shit, you know, I I thought I knew (laughs) this story, but these are angles I hadn't considered. Anything like that? There were some things for me. I mean, um, in some of the essays, maybe just the way people phrase something, I I never thought about that before, but I'm like, wow, yes, that really resonates with my own experience. Um, One of those moments is in Lauren's essay where she says that, sure, the Bible might say to love your neighbor as yourself, but... If your Christianity, the kind of Christianity that you internalize teaches you to hate yourself, then you'll hate your neighbor as you as you hate yourself, you know? And it's like, I knew that on an intuitive level, but I had never been able to articulate it like that. And uh, I also thought in Jessica Powers' essay, J.L. Powers, um, you know, there's some pretty brilliant stuff there about the kinds of stories that get passed around. And I knew these stories and I heard these stories, stories about miracles on the mission field, but how through a sort of game of telephone, they become your own or, you know, it was a friend of a friend and then it becomes your friend or it becomes something that happened on your mission trip. So it becomes so easy for people to believe things that are really like, you know, seven times removed and surely made up, but the stories change. And she wrote about that in a way that I also hadn't really thought about before. And then um, in terms of global stuff, um, Ruby's essay about American inspired megachurches in Singapore just kind of blew my mind. Yeah, I had I had no idea what was going on in Singapore. <laughs> and I mean, our, our book focuses on American stories, but the way that megachurches have evolved in Singapore is so Americanized that the story fit right in. In Singapore? Um, yeah. There, oh, yeah. You got an American style megachurch is going on in Singapore. Oh, yes. You Apparently sh- quite a few. read the essay, yeah. <laughs> prosperity gospel grifting the whole nine yards. Yeah. For me, I also was really surprised. Like, I guess, I mean, I wasn't. So for me. Christianity never felt comforting. It always felt very harsh and uh, judgmental, and it was very freeing for me to get rid of it. But I know intellectually that many people who grow up in it do find comfort in it and that it's, 
it's more painful for them to leave. But um, reading people's stories of that really like drove that home for me in a way that I hadn't fully like emotionally reckoned with before. Um, for example, Liz Lenz's essay, um, Cottonwood Creek, she talks about like this paradise where she grew up and how much she loved, like she and her siblings loved their childhood uh, being homeschooled on this beautiful property in Texas and um, and then kind of realizing that it was never a paradise to begin with and that paradises are actually impossible to create no matter how much we want them. That was a really interesting angle to me. There is a Twitter hashtag, empty the pews on Twitter, a call to take a moral stance against fundamentalism, authoritarianism, and the tactics that conservative churches use to spread, in many cases, cruelty, division, and hate. I drew that from the description page of the book on Amazon. It's interesting, too, because we talk about religion providing a unifying force, and there are churches and religious organizations that have done good. We argue that they're doing humanism, right? I mean, you can skip all the lies and the shaming and stuff. But if we were to look at religion, honestly, it divides more than it unites. Would you agree? I do think so, personally. Uh, I mean, if you really, I want to make it clear that, you know, I don't consider myself anti-religious. I think that pragmatically, it's important to um, build bridges and political coalitions with uh, like-minded believers who share progressive values. And so, you know, I want to listen to them and, and, and how they use religion to make meaning from their own experiences uh, and, and not shame them for that. But I do think that at the end of the day, organized religion does more harm than good. I guess for me, I think I don't I don't feel like I can have an opinion on religion because I feel like it's too big a label that I can't take one single stance on. So, I mean, um, if we were speaking about the Abrahamic faiths or a specific religion, it's easier. But you find both of you find and I get it. I mean, I watched the Satanic Temple, essentially a secular religion who uses the religious model to have a tribe, to get things done, to have community, and there may be some utility in that. I'm, I'm probably in agreement. I, I don't necessarily reject the idea of a religious tribe that embraces science and that kind of stuff. But right. then we run mm-hmm. into the fact that, well, are we cheating the term or the definition of the term religious whenever we use that? So that's a whole other show probably, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, let me just let me just say briefly, I, I don't think we are because um, the way that a lot of people popularly and maybe especially in the atheist community think about religion is to define it as a, a set of metaphysical beliefs that you can't prove and some of which are patently absurd. But this is, in fact, a very Protestant framework, and it's not the way that scholars of religion think about religion. Uh, basically, look, the problem uh, is Protestantism, is what you're saying. Yeah. You hate all well, Protestants. Protestantism is basically a long history of paranoia, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm but, not know, disagreeing. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the sociology of, of religion looks at defining religion for the most part. I mean, there's debate among scholars, but for the most part, through a focus on community. So it's a, a set of rituals, praxis. It doesn't even have to be beliefs, but things that you do in community that give you some sort of, sort of cultural unity and help you uh, sort through life questions and problems. And that can be done in a healthy way, and that can be done in a toxic way. Oh, and even, you know, throwing oh, Abrahamic religion all together, I mean— Judaism has evolved in a massively different way than, than Christianity. And in Judaism, you don't have to believe in God. And in fact, more than half of people who are practicing Jews or observant Jews don't have a belief in the supernatural, which just blows my mind. Uh, but then we get into yep, the slippery your, slope of Protestant, see? <laughs> then we get into the slippery slope of, hey, wait a minute. So then if atheists are organizing under the banner of non-belief or rejection of a belief in God, are we then a religion, which that plays into the narrative of the apologists? And I just I just resist that. Um, yeah, well, it's it's just kind of very it's a very tangled, like multi pronged problem of terminology that yeah 
definitions, right? Know. Words I, I, and I how we define think, them. And, I don't think every community is a religious community, or I don't think every time we have a community, we're doing religion. So let me say that. But community is, in my mind, the more a more central definition of religion than you know having a bunch of things that you have to believe. Nick, if you yeah, want to be think, a secular think, Buddhist, knock yourself out. I mean, I think that's fantastic, <laughs> and, and I think that has merit. You know, if you want to bring the some of the sure. practices and methodology of Buddhism into your life, good for you. You know. Yeah, but no, yeah. I do think that that religion is like ninety percent culture and like ten percent belief, and that's why you can have, you know, very like what is definitely a hundred percent Christianity that like has very little to do with the teachings of Jesus or has very little to do with the Bible, but like that's what Christianity is in many forms. Talking here with Chrissy Stroop, Lauren O'Neill, co-authors of the book Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church, an anthology of stories from people who have, go figure, left the church. Did you find there was an undercurrent of attitudes, a common attitude of, say, relief? Was it bitterness? Are they pissed off at the church? All the above? What was your experience? I mean, I think you will find some anger, which is justified, especially we have some some stories in here with some really horrific abuse. Not all of them are like that. Don't worry. It's not like <laughs> a huge, like torturous slog through the book. But, you know, anger is justified for many, if not all of our contributors. But I do think it's important to point out that bitterness is not a super common theme and that I don't think you can write these kinds of essays if you're still stuck in bitterness. Bitterness is like a stage that you often have to go through uh, after leaving religion, but our authors have come to terms with a lot of stuff, and while, you know, you'll always have a, a large uh, melange of emotions and bitterness may be in the mix, but it's not at all the defining feature. That's interesting. Book. So they've had the opportunity to take enough steps away to see it more objectively and more reflectively. Yeah. Otherwise, you just mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to write this kind of essay. Yeah. There's that uh, insight. I'm not sure who first said it. Uh, write from your scars, not from your wounds. I, I know that um, the uh, progressive Christian author, Rachel Held Evans, who recently uh, died quite young, tragically, uh, she liked that notion of writing from your scars rather than your wounds. And it does make a lot of sense. At the same time, I want to agree with Lauren that anger is valid. I'd also like to say that anger and bitterness are not the same thing. But, you know, when you read through these essays, I think what you'll find, uh, you certainly find common themes. You know, the, the church was too stifling because it was too oppressive in terms of patriarchy or it didn't accept someone's queerness, um, gender, and, and to some extent race, and those kinds of things come up a lot in the book. But in terms of emotions, you know, there's certainly a wide variety. There's some humor in the book. But I would say more often than expressions of anger here, we find expressions of ambivalence. I mean, reading back through it, I'm almost surprised at how many of the essays are ambivalent. And not all of them are. You know, um, Isaac Marion's essay, that I'm glad we ended the book with it, is, you know, pretty emphatic. And it's probably fair to call it anti-theist, but not harshly so. But, you know, a lot of the essays end with uh, people thinking that, you know, it'd still be nice to believe, but I can't. Or, you know, I don't really know where I am now. And or like I miss certain things about believing, but... I've also gained things by leaving the church, and yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody nobody wants to go back for the most part, anyway. Maybe maybe with one or two exceptions, but yeah, we wanted to capture that feeling of identity loss. And you know, previously we were discussing how religion has a lot to do with community and culture, and that's why it's so hard for people to let it go, and why this whole sort of notion, enlightenment notion of well, just educate everybody and religion will disappear, is to my mind, you know, just. It's it's not grounded in reality because that's not how religion works in people's lives. Leaving is hard, and you usually need a powerful personal reason to do it. And um, we believe that people who have done it should be celebrated and their stories should be told. But, you know, for the most part, you're not going to get a bunch of enlightenment narratives of, I was stupid and now I'm smart. It just doesn't work that way. For me, I think perhaps the one thread that is completely consistent throughout the book is honesty. People are being very honest and direct about their experiences. And that ties in with ambivalence because, you know, some of their experiences are good, some are bad. And they're looking at it as a whole 
in a really clear-eyed and sincere way. Speaking to Chrissy's point, I remember coming out of the faith and had this na- naive belief that, man, if, I, if other people saw what I saw, the problems in Scripture and with the church and the, and the history of religion, and if I bring these data points to their attention, there will be rejoicing and they will join me at the exit door as we go off and we start a new life free of dogma. You know, I, this, this I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm being theatrical, yeah. but there was a, there's a truth to that. And instead, when I'm sort of pounding that drum, I was met with an overwhelming and conspicuous silence. Like nobody responded to that. And it's, it's uh, interesting to hear you say that. I mean, many of us have been there and really, you know, realized that, yeah, it doesn't work. In your own personal lives, I mean, would you go back? Would you go back to, if you could take the pill that sends you back to the Matrix, Chrissy Stroop, Lauren O'Neill, would you go? Absolutely not. <laughs> Never in a million years. <laughs> and why not? I mean, life was simpler to- back then. You had easier <laughs> answers. You Honestly, for me, life was much more complicated back then. Like, because I had to constantly be... Um, You know, things that I found that were evidence based, not just like, oh, evolution is clearly true, but I'm not allowed to believe that. But also stuff just like being gay is okay, and I'm not allowed to believe that stuff that was obviously true that I had to pretend was fake made it very complicated for me to believe. And oh, same. <laughs> and I never yeah, I'm sure it's even true for you. Um, And I never really felt like I was always scared of hell and I was never looking forward to heaven it never i never yes. felt comforted by the idea of heaven i never felt any experience of god's love in any way that wasn't just like well the bible says that god loves us so that must be true i guess i was the same way <laughs> it, is, it took the the rejection of a belief in heaven to get rid of my fear of death and you mm. realize, you know, if I really believed in heaven, a place that's the most beautiful thing that I could never imagine here on earth, and if I really believed it, I would be aching for death. But the truth right. with this is that I was actually terrified mm. when I was a believer. Weird. Yeah. Um, there's a, a sociologist uh, who works on lived sec- secularism, Phil Zuckerman, and um, he has some interesting comments, um, observations from people that he talked to when he was looking at, you know, the way that people live secular lives in Scandinavia. Uh, he talked to a nurse at a hospice, and she said many of the people who are most afraid to die are indeed the most devout, which is interesting. But um, for my own story, yeah, I always just sort of felt off and different in my childhood, and I couldn't put my finger on why. I was very scared of hell, very traumatized by that from a young age. When I got a little older, I did sometimes think that the idea of eternity in heaven was kind of boring and, um, you know, or I kind of, I kind of worried about that and then felt guilty for worrying about that. And, um, you know, for me, fear of hell and to a pretty large extent, fear of death, they came later. And, uh, I was trying to sort through maybe these kind of intellectual issues with my religion still at age 33, when I finally realized that I'm actually queer, when I always had just previously thought that I was a weird straight guy, And uh, once I actually realized that and I started moving toward realizing my authentic self that way, my fear of hell dissipated. And, you know, I hadn't believed in it for more than a decade, but I was still very afraid of it on a visceral level. So that was what was going on at a deep level in me that had to be resolved. And I think just growing up in a kind of Christianity that didn't really believe in queerness, you know, queer identities were not validated and I didn't have the mental toolkit until I was in my adulthood to really sort through that sort of stuff. Did I, did I realize that there was something different about me in terms of gender? And then I did realize later that I can be attracted to men as well as women, but I, um, you know, had a history of, in, you know, through my youth being attracted to women and I still am. So uh, I could always just kind of tell myself that I was straight even though I never felt right in my body, and I just didn't know why. I remember coming out of the faith, and it's almost like I had to introduce me to myself. Like, you know, now that I've walked away from all these things that informed my identity, who am I really? What are my values? What do I want? What do I care about? And I had to go issue by issue in my life and reevaluate with this new lens of critical thinking, And I emerged the other side quite different than I was 
back in the early days. Back in the early days, I sort of separated the world into binary thinking, right? Good, evil, mm -hmm. black, white, right? It was us, them. I'm actually doing some writing on this subject in my own life, talking about the other, right? It's easy. When you are chosen by God and you are the one who's theologically correct and all these other things, then you can just sort of brush everybody else away with a really convenient swipe of the hand. When you get out and you realize that, hey, it's, it's a messier world, but I get to approach these issues on my own yes. terms. This was the case mm -hmm. with you, right? Yes. I, I spent so many years. You would think that the idea would be, I believe, you know, that Christ died for our sins and then rose again. And therefore, I am a Christian, right? But for so many of us who are raised in the faith, it's I am a Christian. Therefore, I believe X, Y, Z. Mm. My beliefs were there was just like a little kit of beliefs that I could draw from. So I, I had this a similar experience where. Once I was gone, I was like, wait, what are my, what do I believe if I don't have to draw from this little box anymore? Yeah, I can definitely relate. There was a lot of wrestling with identity loss for me and asking these questions of who am I? And I finally feel like at age 39 that I'm figuring it out. Probably, uh, I don't know, is it part of your therapy, for lack of a better word? You know, putting this anthology together, being involved with the book, Empty the Pews, has to be part of your journey, right? It is it like this and um and I also co-host a podcast about the Bible from like a from an atheist perspective but more from like a literary and historical perspective and both of those they've really let me come to terms with my former religion that previously I just whenever I thought about it I was like oh I hate that and I I don't want to think about it and it sucked and it was bad you know <laughs> and, and I couldn't really like yeah. get any deeper than that um and so through this book and the podcast I've been able to be at peace with it and and just it is what it is and i get to live my life the way i want and that's that yeah there's a lot of processing that needs to be done i was doing some of it in grad school when i was actually studying modern russian history because my interest developed as a short-term youth missionary to russia which is what i write about in, in my essay in empty the pews uh so i started studying you know early 20th century Russian Christian intellectuals and how they responded to the First World War and things like that, and found that, you know, they were widely respected by scholars of Russia. But if you kind of cut through the fin de siècle high modernist vocabulary that they used, they sounded a lot like early 20th century Russian Pat Robertson's. Like, it was super familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, so I, was, <laughs> so I was actually doing some processing of, like, how religious ideology operates in the world and seeing parallels between early 20th century Russia and late 20th century America. And then I realized that there actually are connections and pieces that you can put together in the middle, but that's a whole other story. Can um, I just say that um, I've never <laughs> wanted a noun to be plural less than Pat Robertson? <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's a fair point. Who's your target audience with this? I mean, are you trying to encourage the ex-believer or are you trying to inform the lifelong believer or something else? I mean, who are you going for? Yeah, we have a couple kind of core audiences in mind. Definitely, I think, first and foremost, it's other former believers so that they can kind of find this community through this book and know that they're not alone and know that their experiences are valid and important. But we also, you know, I mean, Chrissy, you can speak to this. We have um, a lot of interest in reaching, you know, not necessarily believers, although they would, I think, benefit from reading this, but the the pundit class that mm -hmm. that portrays religion in a very benign way and seems not to have an awareness that us former believers exist and there's a lot of us. Sure. And the liberal public that's informed by that pundit class that, for the most part, still ignores our stories. And, um, you know, I think there are a lot of Christians of good faith, so to speak, more progressive Christians who would read this book. I know I know some of them have. And I mean, one of my favorite blurbs that we have is from Reverend Dr. Andre Johnson, uh, Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Media Studies at the University of Memphis, and he's also a pastor. And he says, the essays that make up Empty the Pews can be instructive and helpful for us folks in the church. I write can be because in order for the essays to benefit us, we must be open to listen and learn. And, um, you know, he's a, he's a man that I've had the chance to meet and work with a little bit, a, a social justice pastor who's often out on the streets protesting in Memphis. And I just have the greatest respect for him. And, you know, I really appreciate Christians like him who are willing to listen to those of us who have left Christianity. It's an interesting thing, too, to see 
an example of those who disagree on theology but line up in values. I'd sure like to see more of that. It's why I support a lot of the interfaith activism where, you know, secular groups are actually working hand in hand with religious groups to be a part of their communities, to meet needs, to alleviate suffering. It solves mm-hmm. a lot of problems. We are stronger together. It allows us the opportunity to sort of break down those barriers that divide us and often results in some really productive conversation, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. With the, the permission of the authors, I'm going to read a segment from the book, Leaving the Pews. Any final thoughts from either of you on uh, what it is, what it does? You want to kind of pitch it for the audience? I really would like to see this thing <laughs> you know, supported, and I'm going to link it in the description box to make sure that everybody can access it easily. I see it's a paperback. It's on Kindle. If you guys ever need help with the audio book, you just call my people. We'll we'll figure that (laughs) out. But uh, I mean, final thoughts from either or both of you. What do you think? Um, You know, I'm really just kind of hoping that it does break through to um, help change the national conversation around religion. Because to my mind, the current state of affairs is that we have a de facto Christian public sphere That's really deleterious to American democracy, you know, so I would just like to see the book succeed and be widely read for that reason, because I think the way that the major newspapers represent evangelicalism, for example, is is a serious problem. They normalize extremism, normalize authoritarianism, and these are the people who who are at the center of power in the United States government right now. I think it's also really important for other former believers to be able to read stories like these. One of the things that is often most painful to lose when you when you leave the church is the sense of community. And there is a community out here. <laughs> it's very disparate, but you can find it. And this book is one way they can help you find it. You may feel alone, but you are not alone. And we'd like to help you connect to the community that you may have lost or a perhaps even a better, more accepting community that's not chained to the dogma. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Lauren O'Neill, Chrissy Stroop. The authors of Empty the Pews, I say authors, you are editors of the book, the anthology, but you've also authored parts of the book. Would that be an accurate way to say it? Yes. Empty the Pews, stories of leaving the church. Congratulations on getting the notices in the media, the Washington Post and beyond. Hopefully more in the public sphere will take notice. I'd like to think we're a part of that. We're going to get the word out. Links in the description box. And thank you both so very much for your great work. Thank you, Thank you for it's, having us. It's been great chatting with you. Short break. I'll be right back and we're going to read from the book, Empty the Pews, right after this. What if there was a 50% off sale happening every time you went shopping for razors? Well, Shaving with Harry's is kind of like that. They offer premium blade refills as low as two bucks each. That's up to 55% off compared to the price of Gillette Fusion Pro Shield. Harry's is how I shave. The blades are quality. The ergonomic handle is comfy. I'm so impressed with the Harry's way of shaving that I give Harry's shave kits as gifts on special occasions. I'm also really impressed with the fact that they skip the middleman. They skip all the gimmicky stuff that compounds prices, and they set aside a percentage of proceeds for nonprofit causes like supporting our veterans. And they back up everything with a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, just let them know. They will give you a full and complete refund. And now there's another reason to experience the Harry's difference. On top of the value that you already get, Harry's has an amazing offer for listeners of my show. New customers get $5 off a trial set at harrys.com slash the thinking atheist. You will get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel with aloe and travel cover. So join the millions of guys who are already saving money and go to harrys.com slash the thinking atheist to claim your offer. Okay, this is a chapter from the book Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church. It's called Land of Plenty. It's written by Garrett Conley. And thanks to the authors and editors for allowing me to uh, read this segment here on the air. It goes like this. In some versions, you may see a cross or an occasional conch when you saw only one set of footprints. 
Above the shore, you may see a blue sky, or a blinding orange sunrise, or the airbrushed pink of a Floridian sunset. It was then that I carried you. I look at it now, this framed poster of two feet patterning stand, with the poem's lines overlaid in script, and I wonder whose feet were these? Who came to this bare patch ashore and put aside shoes to tread carefully in the damp? Nothing and no one else around, only this delicate ballerino now out of frame, invisible Jesus. Was there some committee, perhaps, in charge of surveying church members' feet to determine which arch seemed most Jesus-y? Had there been a vote? I've stood in this exact spot in my father's office at church countless times, and never once, before this moment, considered the poem's origins. This double vision is relatively new. As recently as five years ago, I would have sought in these words the assurance that Jesus Christ would always be there for me during the trials and tribulations of my life. Now I know better. I walk past the frame to a windowed corner of my father's office, where a fake baby palm collects dust, waiting for the voices in the foyer to quiet so I can enter the sanctuary unnoticed. My father's congregants will want to hug, pat my shoulders, tisk tisk my skinniness. They'll want to ask about the Eastern European city I've been living in since graduating college, to know if they eat dogs over there. They will want to ask about women. Gravel crunches on the other side of the window. A few stragglers my father likes to tease every Sunday morning. Bob, you ever going to learn to set an alarm? These minor lapses, I almost envy them. I haven't attended one church service since last summer's visit. The post-Soviet village where I now teach, having long abandoned any significant religious affiliations, the party's atheism enforced by school teachers as recently as two decades ago. At that time, my school director told me, if you see a neighbor go to church, you write their name down and send it to Moscow. There's a list, you see, and you do not want to be on this list. A nobler profession, I said, laughing a little. Good and bad things in this time, she said. So now people go to church, no one notices. As it should be, I said. Several male voices in the foyer. The piano picking up somewhere behind them. Lord, a deep baritone says, help people open their hearts to you this morning. We pray for the glory and goodness of God's grace to fill up this church. This voice belongs to someone in my father's core prayer team, the Brotherhood. I picture them in their usual huddle, arms wrapped around one another's shoulders. I've ducked into his office to avoid them. As the preacher's only son, I'm still seen as a natural extension of his ministry. The truth, the job always seemed harder than it should have. I followed my father down neighborhood streets to knock on doors and distribute literature. I attended his jail ministry, visited hospitals to comfort the sick and dying, and consequently repentant. For a good decade, I read the onion skin pages of my name-embossed Bible every morning before school and every night before sleep. Aside from the rare moments when I felt God's love spreading somewhere beneath my ribcage, a feeling of warmth and peace that left after only a few minutes, none of it added up to ecstasy. You catch one glimpse of St. Teresa's famous marble throat waiting to be pricked, and Europe convinces you that the Protestants have long forgotten real pleasure. Potlucks, revivals, holiday services. Each summer I come home, I'm astounded at the growing list of joyless responsibilities, a list I likely would have followed for the rest of my life had I not left. I watch my parents' lives narrow to fit this tiny corner of the Ozarks, and then I board another transatlantic flight. Once, years ago, only six really, it was my mother and me on a plane out of this town on our way to see real coconut palms, Joan Didion's In the Islands open on my tray table. I was 19, free for the summer. I was going to Honolulu because I wanted to see life expanded to a novel. 
That line rang like a jingle in my head the whole trip. Whenever I felt an overwhelming sense of shame about the gay man I now believed myself to be. I was going to Honolulu because I wanted to see life expanded to a novel. When a tall, thick-dicked man stepped out of a mud bath and began to rinse himself in an open shower stall, my mother far away in a separate women's spa, I was going to Honolulu because I wanted to see life expanded to a novel. Whenever I recalled the circumscribed narrative my life had become after two weeks of ex-gay reparative therapy in the month before coming to these islands, a narrative that said I was addicted to gay sex, broken, God-forsaken, I was going to Honolulu. I wasn't about to stop being gay any more than my father was about to stop being a preacher, and my mother wasn't about to stop being a mother, and also his wife. She must have planned that trip to Hawaii so soon after my failed therapy, because something in her knew we needed to escape my father's territory, that great buckle of the Bible belt, or else our family might not make it another year. Now, in my father's office at church, I hear the piano swelling, congregants' voices growing louder, Beulah Land, I'm longing for you. Or at least I think that's what they're playing. These songs blend together after a while, all that triumph and joy and longing bound up in a handful of chords. I'm already late. I grip one of the fake palm leaves, dust flaring in the morning light. On Diamond Head, you're more likely to be carried along the shore by a B-movie stunt double than a white-robed invisible ballerino savior, but the islands are still the closest most of our middle-class congregations ever gotten to real paradise. Before church services, congregants share rubbery Walmart photos of their trips, ink attributions smearing on their fingers, and adding a well-worn quality to the mass-produced. They that coo over these photos in a church sanctuary seem to add a sense of divine providence to these trips, as if one by one they are destined to reach those shores. I wanted room for flowers, Didion writes, and reef fish and people who may or may not be driving one another to murder, but in any case are not impelled by the demands of narrative convention to say so out loud. On Diamond Head there had been flowers and reef fish, there had been lays and grass skirts and glittering glass facades that caught the sunrise and sunset and sent them back to you in spades. Bottled water that cracked louder than knuckles to let you know it had never been touched. There had been white arced beaches and someone to come along and shift your shade as the sun moved across the sky. A physical luxury that embarrassed and excited me. Sweet Violet Poi, our bare-chested waiters warned, might taste a little funny, and a sweet chili sauce my mother and I never tasted before, but that sent us to the gift shop to purchase several bottles so we'd never be without it for the foreseeable future. For two people raised in a small town, the sudden variety was an assault on the senses, and one we welcomed. After only a few days of paradise, we'd already grown accustomed to a life of pampering, Whatever Tennessee Williams dramas awaited us upon our return seemed part of another life, meant for two other actors with significantly less enchanted roles. Sitting in the buttery recessed light of a famous beauty parlor, shears clipping the back of my head, my mother and I watched my newly handsome face emerge from a messy tangle I'd let grow out over the past few distressing months, I thought, perhaps for the first time in my life, of how profoundly setting can sculpt us. Here in the islands, it seemed people wouldn't make such a fuss over what my life had become, or at least they wouldn't waste their money on something as bleak as those white-walled, ex-gay facilities and their stern-faced counselors. If we die on this plane, my mother'd said on the long ride over, how fast do you think we'll make it to heaven? Now, walking out of the beauty parlor to a view of the green-rimmed volcano, she was asking if we could stay in the islands forever, not in the least concerned with an abstract paradise. That time she'd almost drowned. At the age of eleven, the water would suddenly clouded, she told me, and a voice called out to her. Relax, the voice said. Relax. 
This is what water can do to a person, she told me. Not the water of my father's narrow baptistry, where he dips a newly converted congregant every other month in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but rather the deep, expansive bodies that can swallow us whole at any moment. Relax. There's nothing more for you to do. I was looking for you, my mother says now, in our church in Arkansas. She's standing in the office doorway, rhinestones winking on her sleeves, dressed all in white lace and bejeweled. She is an angel, couture precious moments. I'm dressed the part as well, clean cut with a white button down. Coming off the plane, I'd been big bearded and disheveled. My clothes have now been freshly laundered by a machine I haven't had access to for almost two years. If Hawaii was excess and the Ozarks sacrifice, what then has Ukraine been for me? Something different, I suppose, which is all that really matters when you're living between two extremes. When your mother is who she is and your father is who he is, and you're now who you are in a country neither of them has ever imagined, much less seen. When she used to pick me up from school, I would feel shame at the outlandishness of her outfits, worried that some part of me was reflected in her physical garishness. My father had worried, too, though we wouldn't know this until my freshman year of college, when my parents began talking to church leaders about reparative therapy. What if you spoiled the boy, he'd said to her. What if you spent too much time with him? All those malls, all that standing at makeup counters. It's only an hour, she says now. No one's going to bite. Everyone hates me in there, I say. Everyone loves you. They pray for you every day. For the wrong reasons, I say. But still, I come to my father's morning service half out of habit and half out of a desire to finally understand the schism that took place after I abandoned ex-gay therapy, after it had become impossible to take seriously the notion that I could continue communicating with a God who seemed to prefer me dead to gay. Had it really happened? Had I imagined it all? Is it really possible after all those years of church, three times a week, of prayer before every meal and every night's sleep, to be free of shame at last. I need to know for certain, and I feel as though this Sunday, fresh off the plane from the tiny Ukrainian village I now call home, protected by the invisible bubble that reverse culture shock has placed between everything I once saw as making up the world and what I now know to be only a small part of the world, an isolated and incomplete part even, This, out of all Sunday mornings, this is the perfect time to test out my new agnosticism. I follow my mother through the foyer to the sanctuary. We take a pew in the back, unnoticed. My father is sitting near the front, nodding to the music. My mother opens a hymnal and points to the spot where we are. Something, something, blood of the Lamb... The piano sounds slightly out of tune, but then again, all these pianos sound the same, so it's hard to tell. I mumble along, careful not to pronounce the words too clearly. I'm afraid of making promises once again to capital G God. The deacons stand and walk to the front of the sanctuary to face us, heads bowed, a prayer that my father will be guided only by God's will that he will remove any personal concerns and selfish thoughts from his mind and become a vessel for the Lord. The congregants shout, Amen. And my father slowly makes his way up the stage to the pulpit, Bible in hand, his newly graying hair not unlike the preachers you see on TV, but wispy and alive, crackling almost, as if some heavenly wind tussles only his head. He sighs, and the speakers pick up feedback, and he says, that's just the Holy Ghost testing the mic. In the nervous laughter that follows, you can feel the tension of my father's spiritual burden being temporarily released. He will start with these jokes, see? And this will make room in our hearts for the seriousness to come. 
It's my father's signature move. In the jail ministry, it was candy preceding the sobering message to follow. On neighborhood visits, it was bags of popcorn. I would hold the bags in my hands, a goofy grin on my face, and when my father gave the cue, usually a slight nod, I'd hand them over. Suffer little children, my father would quote, and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19.14 He'd run a rough hand through my hair and say, Pretty good kid, ain't he? In a southern vernacular, he rarely used outside of those visits. The drawl, the ain'ts, the well, I don't know about that. I've never seen him speak to someone in a voice that isn't their own. When it's just him and me now, I'm careful not to say too much, not to reveal the new registers I've adopted as a way of distancing myself from the voices of my childhood. I once gifted him a copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, and by the end of the week he'd emailed me two of the poems from inside. Inspired by Whitman's capacious love for the world, they were overwhelmingly erotic missives to Jesus in heaven— though I'm sure my father never understood them that way, which is his ability to find the decent in anything and fashion it to his purposes. I don't know why this happened, he says now, laughing. I can't begin to explain it. One second you're typing away in your study, and the next something hits you, just like a hand slapping your face. I'll bet you know what I'm talking about, Ray. You look at Ray and think at some point somebody must have slapped that grin off his face. Amen, if you congregants shout. Laughter. Nah, I'm just kidding, Ray. Ray's a beacon of hope, always smiling. Every time I look out at this crowd, always smiling, like I was saying. I was just sitting in my study and felt a slap like God was telling me to wake up. I had a whole sermon prepared for you nice folks. Weeks of work, late nights. But I laid all that aside and started listening to what the Lord was telling me. Now, I don't know if everyone here has experienced this, he says, his gaze following the line of pews to where my mother and I are sitting. But I know my son has, haven't you, son? And here is the moment of drawing in that I've been dreading all morning. I resist the familiar tug of my father's words, ignore the congregant stares, and fix my eyes on the wooden edge of the pulpit, my lips in a slight smile I hope is indiscernible. My heartbeat's going wild, and I wonder if people around me can hear it in the quiet pause. My mother turns to stone beside me. We're slipping into our old roles, I think already on our way back to the ex-gay facility, but the double vision hasn't left me yet. I am both his son and not his son. I am both native and tourist, a speaker of tongues he does not yet know, believer and non-believer. How do I describe it, he says, that feeling when you get inspiration strikes, a voice, a call, You think the message is adding up to one thing, and it turns out it's something completely different. My son writes these stories, and he tells me after a while that characters start acting on their own, leading lives you'd never wanted them to lead, and the best you can do is follow their voices. How many times has this been true in my life? I never dreamt I'd be standing before you as your pastor. I never thought God would use me for this. I never thought I'd hear God's voice so clearly saying to me, you'd better drop everything and take up the cross and follow me. But here I am, he says, his right hand slapping the pulpit, standing before you. Standing before me, my father is claiming yet another territory This expanse of the imagination to which I thought I alone and my family held the key. On my first day at the facility, my ex-gay counselors ripped five pages of a short story from my notebook. They wadded the pages into a ball and tossed them in a nearby trash can and said, False image, as if that was all they were. No room for distractions here, only God's voice allowed. Whenever I see Baptist missionaries on the streets of Ukraine, I think, don't you have enough already? 
go back home to the southern towns where a church rests on every street corner. Go back home to the country that loves your fundamentalism so much it's willing to vote against its population's best interests. Go back home to a South that spends so much time and energy killing its children. Why do you need this place, too? But that's the thing about proselytizers, isn't it? The word comes from the Greek proslitos, meaning stranger. Christians have always seen themselves as strangers in a strange land, never at home in this vile world, because their mansion awaits them in heaven. There are no real borders to cross on this earth because the only border that matters is the one above their heads. They see no end to God's dominion. I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own, Whitman writes, and limitless are leaves stiff and drooping in the fields. Of course my father loves him. So I kept writing, my father says, stepping out from behind the pulpit and beginning to pace the stage. And I wrote for hours and hours all night. And you know the funny thing about all this time I spent writing? The message God was telling me to share with you folks, it was a message about the nature of time itself. Now a thousand years on earth is as a day in heaven. Now, I'm not a big math person, he says, stepping down from the stage and wiping his forehead with a handkerchief. I just about failed all those courses in high school, but would you believe it, Sister Julie, if I said to you an entire lifetime on this earth, that is to say about a hundred years, if we're lucky, is only one-tenth of a day in heaven... Why, that's nothing but a blip in the universe, a blink of the eye. You see, Sister Julie, I think what God was trying to tell me was that I needed to stop focusing on the small things, on how many hours I spent trying to type up a sermon for you. I needed to focus on how few hours we actually have left on this earth, how few opportunities I have to spread the message to you folks that Jesus Christ was born and died and rose again to heaven to intercede on our behalf so that we might have everlasting life. My mother shifts uncomfortably beside me. She knows the literalism gets to me. On the islands, she'd been able to laugh with me at the performative spectacle of faux-native Hawaiian life. Now she's looking away at the giant mural of a map on the sanctuary's right wall. Hawaii is too small to see from here. I could write my father's words myself, I think, without God's voice whispering in my ear, and in under an hour. Joke theory of life, anecdote, Bible verse, altar call, everything neat and tidy by lunch, perhaps a nap in the late afternoon. You see, Sister Julie, it's only people like my father who think life is too short. When you're in ex-gay therapy and witness a man standing before your group to confess for perhaps the seventh or eighth time to yet another suicide attempt, scars marking his unsuccessful ventures, you begin to think differently about how much longer you have on this earth. How many times had I run the scissors blades across my neck? staring into a face I no longer recognized, terrified by the fact that if I did not change my sexuality on some fundamental molecular level, I would lose my family and friends and the town I grew up in. How many times did I look back on 18 years and curse God for leaving me in my greatest time of need? Time, without the comforts of family or God or a place to call home, Time is not something all of us automatically crave. My father's assumptions about us only work if we swallow them whole, without thinking, as I had for most of my life. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? The famous angelological question goes. An infinite number, my father would say, if only you believe in angels. Turn to any page of the Bible and look on it with believing eyes, and you'll find a thousand new interpretations. You'll spawn a thousand new denominations. Already within the Baptist spectrum alone, there are hundreds. Now I know some of you today have been touched by this message, my father says. 
heading to the center of the altar and falling to his knees, head bowed. I can see it in your eyes. I'm not going to name names or point any fingers. The pianist makes her way to the stage, and as she begins playing, the music is soft and quiet, a lullaby. When I was a baby, my father would hold me to his chest and rock me, singing a song he must have made up one midnight hour when I wouldn't stop crying. He's a good old boy to me. He's a good old pal to me. He's a good old boy. He's a good old pal. He's a good old friend to me. I remember that song even now. Even in the very moment, I want most of all to distance myself from him. Even though it seems impossible to recall such an early memory, I remember it not because the lullaby was an earworm, but because of the way his voice vibrated throughout my entire body. I can approximate the tune by conjuring the feel of those vibrations in his chest, a feeling so overwhelming that when the tune passed through me, it was my entire world. There was no other sensation. I remember drifting into sleep as the world dimmed around me. Someone in this room feels Jesus calling their heart, my father says, his voice filling with sorrow. I know it. We're going to close our eyes, all of us in here, and we're going to ask God to touch this person. Lord, please give him or her the strength to walk down this aisle and surrender to Jesus. Please, Lord, while the music plays softly. Lord, you are the Almighty, a mover of mountains. You have the power to change this one person's life, to save his soul from eternal hellfire. A few congregants move past me to the altar. Oh, please, Lord, they shout. Please help him. No matter how many years have passed, no matter how many times I've argued with my father about homosexuality in the Bible, no matter how many trips home I take, I always think he's talking about me in such moments. The music swells. Beulah land, congregants sing. Sweet Beulah land. I stay rooted to my spot. Immovable mover. The chapter Land of Plenty by Garrett Conley from the book Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church. Thank you so much to my special guests and to you for listening. And I will see you back here next time. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.